of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. To the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Oh God, you are faithful. Seasons change. to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, your history can prove, there's nothing you can do, you're faithful and true, though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast, and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will Faithfulness to me Great is your faith
Good morning, church. How are we doing? That's two people in the house. Good morning, church. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Hey, how are you doing? It's so good um, to be here. Um, I thought that was an amazing song. Mary did summarize it quite well, but it just means um, that there's no one else other than God. And when you hear the life of um, the testimony and, and her life, you, you, I wish she'll probably share another day, but really there is no one else that could have brought her and her family out of um, what they went through. So that's kind of in a nutshell what that song um, was about. She didn't sing those same lines for about five minutes, um, but just in a gist, that's what it was. It's all good. Thank you. So it's so good um, to be here. Um, I was, I've been brought up in this church. I've grew up in this church. I was baptized in this church, in this building, actually. Um, and so to them, be able to be here and share is just an honor, but also a testimony of uh, of God's goodness um, and everything he is. So, um, But also a testament to the church um, and the leaders here, the pastors, uh, and everyone that's been able to pour into my life to help me um, stay and be rooted and planted, which hasn't been smooth sailing by any means, but God's good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, uh, Vanakam. Vanakam. Um, you don't know what you're saying, <laughs> but now you can turn to your other neighbor, uh, the neighbor that you don't really like that much because you didn't turn to them in the first place, um, and say, Abri. Abri, Abri, Abri. Um, appreciate I may have made it a bit o- awkward for some of you guys, but um, today we're talking about honesty and integrity, so I just want to make sure that we're honest, amen? Um, Vanakam basically means hello, it's a greeting in Tamil, um, Abri is a, is a very shortened slang version of saying basically what's up, as opposed to how you're doing. So, you've come today to church, um, you're about to be fed spiritually, you're going to be sped, fed um, physically, and you've learned some Tamil. So maybe we should do these services more often. Yeah, let's do it. And just actually, just on that, how many people have had uh, Sri Lankan cuisine before? Yeah. yeah, come on, okay. Okay, quite a few people. Um, a few people haven't. So make sure you stay back because that was a testament to how good Sri Lankan food is. Um, And some of your taste buds are going to get a fresh anointing in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Yeah, it might be. We've told them to tone it down a bit. But if it is spicy, then you can log your complaints to Jackie and um, someone will pick it up. But we're good. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you're good. Um, And I just pray that, Father God, that you will speak through me and that people will hear you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I appreciate um, a lot of you don't really know me. Um, You may have seen me and thought, who's this funny-looking Asian kid running around? Um, But my name is Daniel. Uh, I've been, um, as I said, part of the Town Fellowship for a few years. Um, And if people were to describe me, um, one of the things they'll say is I'm clumsy. Now, I'm not putting my best foot forward here, but it's good to be honest, like I said. So... Clumsiness is probably something that people describe me as. In fact, people that are close to me, um, that are there in the Tamil Fellowship, would actually have actually given me gifts to help me with my clumsiness because I've, I've lost many things. Um, I've lost iPhones, that's plural. I've lost iPads. I've lost wallets. Um, so we're on this journey, so please keep me in your prayer. In fact, the phone I have right now, I've had for two years, so there's grace and we're, we're progressing. But um, clumsiness is definitely something that will describe me. Um, and as a result of that clumsiness, um, as I said, I've lost many things that I'm not too proud of. But what I've found is that the acts of honesty and integrity in today's society is more of a shock and a surprise than the lack of it. So we're more surprised when someone does something that displays honesty and integrity than we are when we don't see it. Um, out of all the items that I listed that I've lost, um, I was only ever returned one item back. Um, And I remember it very clearly. It was a wallet that I lost when I was doing a summer internship many years ago. Um, And I lost all my cards, uh, all the cash that I had, my ID. And I wasn't around family, so it was quite tough. And when I got a phone call from the police station and they said someone has handed your wallet in, it was an absolute relief. But I also was very shocked that someone actually gave my wallet back. So it's a surprise and something that is not that common in today's society. Um, But when we look at the Bible and we look at what Jesus has called us to do and how he wants us to live, we see that integrity and honesty is actually something that's spoken about quite often. 
um, integrity, I think, is mentioned in the time in the Bible um, about 16 times. So, you know, it's definitely something that is worth talking about, I'd assume. And the word integrity comes from um, actually a Latin word, which I've forgotten, but you could Google that up and find out where it's from. Um, but I know what it means, and it basically came from being integral and being integrated. Um, we have so many touch points today. Um, you know, we touch with uh, our friends, we touch with our work colleagues, we touch, we have so many different endpoints, and we could almost have a separate way of living in all of those circumstances. And to be integrated means to have a same um, personnel, a same experience, and a same kind of attitude in every area of our life. Um, and if we're to, to, to translate that, it means to honor Jesus and live for Jesus in every area of our life. Um, and so before we talk about integrity, it's also worth noting that integrity does not mean perfection by any means. Um, because when I first got this topic, I thought, yo, this is a topic for Pastor Doug. Uh, it's not for me. Because um, integrity can be quite daunting, you know. You, you hear the word and it's just such a big word that we talk about. And it is, but it is not perfection. Um, but integrity is, is a journey that we could go through um, and to seek God in everything. Uh, Proverbs 21 verse 3 says this. To do what is right and just is, a, is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Um, and so integrity and the way we live is actually more pleasing for God than some of the things we actually do. Um, and integrity is a life where Jesus leads and directs our life in every aspect of our life. And so I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about integrity um, and, and talk to you about a person in the Bible um, who wasn't quite integral or honest um, and that led to some implications, um, and I just want to share a few points from that story with you guys. And before I do, I actually forgot to shout out my mom, who's here, and it's her birthday. So let's actually just give her, let's wish her a happy birthday. She wasn't expecting that, but I just remember that, so let's give her a little shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know my mom quite well, and that probably made her uncomfortable, but that's good. I got her. I paid her back for all the time she made me feel uncomfortable, so we're good. <laughs> we're good. We're good. But turn uh, your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13 from verses 5 to 13. That's 1 Samuel 13, verse 5 to 13. It's in the Old Testament. If you're in 1 Thessalonians, you've gone way too far, but if you're somewhere where Psalms, just keep going back and you might get there. If you're there, say, I'm there. I'm there. Amen. Okay. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Mishma, east of Beth-Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and in cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Basically, they ducked. Um, Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's man began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offerings. And just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, asked Samuel? Saul replies, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and what the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the commandment the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel of all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commandment. Um, this story or this incident is about a man named Saul. Saul was actually the first king of Israel. He was appointed by God. Um, and you could read about him in, in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. But 
he, you, you, when you read about him, you find out that he wasn't a man of honesty and integrity. And a lot of it boiled down to this moment. Um, he still carried on doing a few things after. But this moment was a pivotal point for him and his journey. And it cost him quite a bit. And so, as I said, just from here, I want to pull out a few points to help us with integrity and honesty. And the first thing I want to say is integrity is built on principles. Integrity is built on principles. And principles are built on absolute truth. And so absolute truth is truth that does not sway, that does not sway or is moved by opinion. For example, one plus one is two. Does anyone have any other thoughts about that? No? Okay, we're good. I mean, I can't wake up one morning, look at my bank account and think, you know what, right now my ones needs to look like fives. And so one plus one has got to equal something else. That doesn't work. One plus one is two and it's an absolute truth. There's no sway in that. And when we take that and we build principles that help us to build maybe buildings like this one that are built on mathematical and architectural principles that allow us all to come here safely um, and not have any incidents or ha have anything crumble down. If someone came here and said, you know what, I think this building could hold about 200 people so we should be good or that angle is fine. The reality is the building will at some point crumble. There will be pain, there will be death and there will be heartache and pain because it was built on opinions and not principles. But the fact that this building is actually built on principles means we're all here and we're safe. I hope, anyway. Um, and the truth, and the same is true with our lives. If we build lives based off of opinions and not truth, then the reality is at some point things will start to crumble. And I think that we live in a society where people build their lives off of principles that are governed and built on opinions rather than truth. Oh, it's okay to do that. It's okay to be unequally yoked. Oh, it's okay to sell drugs. Or it's okay to do certain things to make ends meet. And so we take all of these opinions and we start building principles that, that, that we try to govern our life with. And the reality is, when that happens, just like if this building was built on opinions, things will at some point begin to crumble. And so your question is probably, well, what is truth? Um, and to answer that, I want to talk to you about Jesus because the Bible says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so everything that stems from Jesus is truth, and that is absolute truth. Anything that moves away from that then becomes opinion. And so the Word of God, the Bible that we have, which, is, which was in the beginning and was with God and was the Word of God, is absolute truth. And so if we're not building our life on truths in the Bible, but rather opinions by society then we're setting ourselves up for things that may crumble and fall down at some point. And then the question becomes, well, how do I actually know that? And if we're not spending time reading the Word of God, if we're not spending time and have daily time to actually read the truth, then how can we build principles on truth? We end up building principles on opinion. And so integrity is built on principles that need to be built up from truth. And if we are not building up these principles and we're letting opinions sway us, if we're letting society feed into us, saying adultery is okay in marriages or it's all right to cheat, then the reality is we will be setting ourselves up for something that will eventually crumble down. And if you look at the life of Saul, um, Saul did not build his life on truth. Um, you, it's not just this one account. You could read through many accounts, as I said, First Samuel, Second Samuel. Um, but Saul knew what was right and wrong but he still chose to build his life off of principles that were opinion-based and not truth. And in this very incident, he ends up giving and sacrificing burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. This was against truth. Saul knew that the commandment of God was that he should have never done this, and he moved away from that, and that cost him big. It cost him his calling. It cost him his kingdom. So that's my first point. My second point is this. Integrity is tested in adversity. Um, verse 5 says this, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. That's a lot of people. If you look at the verses above, Israel had 3,000 people in their army and the mass does not add up. So I don't blame Saul and his people for being scared because I would have been scared as well. In fact, some people actually left. They said, this ain't for me and they started leaving. So, you know, when people leave, there's probably fear as well. So, a key test of how we live our lives is in adversity. 
is when things get tough, is when things look quite fearful. And, you know, we've heard some great testimonies today, and I think it's so encouraging that there are people that have, through the trials, through the tough times, have chosen to live with integrity, have chosen to still be built on the principles of God. And we have seen and heard those testimonies today and how wonderful it was. I mean, to hear that testimony about Chris and the reaction, it was just amazing. But that was a tough moment, I'm sure. And so many of us have gone through tough moments, and tough moments test our integrity. Um, it was the fear when they saw the amount of people that caused the Israelites to start panicking. People started leaving Saul. People were afraid. And that's when Saul's integrity was tested. Because integrity is not tested in the times where it's easy. Integrity is t- tested in the times where it's tough. You know, it was easier for Shatrach, Meshach, and Abednego to worship gods in Israel where it was forbidden to worship an idol than it was to worship God in, in Babylon. Um, it was easy for Job to be integral when he was very rich, had all the Teslas, Rolls Royces, and all the other things of the world, than when everything went. And so integrity is tested in these tough moments, just like it was tested for Saul. And I want to ask, what do we do when there is a fear of panic? And I think we've all come through a journey of at least in the last two years where everyone could relate to that. Every single one of us has gone through something tough. And, what do, and we don't know what tomorrow looks like is a, is a reality. No one expected the pandemic. We had all plans to travel the world or whatever we had and something here. And so my question is, what do we do when things are getting tough? What do we do when people start leaving? What do we do when marriages feel like they're about to break, when bills may become harder to pay or when we lose someone? What do we do? Do we still live a life of integrity? Do we still serve Jesus based on the truth? Or do we sway away and start doing things that maybe we shouldn't have done? Because when Saul saw people leaving, when Saul saw the the fear of the enemy in front of him, he started doing those things that he shouldn't have done. He started giving those burnt offerings. He started doing things um, that compromised his integrity and honesty. And my, my kind of last point maybe is this, is integrity is tested in the waiting. Integrity is tested in the waiting. First time in 10, 8. A few chapters before, Samuel had t- tell Saul to go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what to do. Verse 8 of the chapter we just read, chapter 13. Saul waited seven days, the time set by Saul, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to set, scatter. Saul waited seven days. So I will read that as it's not the eighth day, it's still the seventh day. And Saul waited seven days, the time set. Seventh day was not over, and Saul begins to compromise on his integrity. He begins to, to, to give the, 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 the sacrifices. And waiting can be tough, right? Um, waiting can be tough, um, especially in the generation that we're in. It's so easy to get a, a lasagna in three minutes than to actually cook one. Um, and I haven't tried to cook a lasagna, so it must take longer than three minutes. Um, it's so easy to get cook a lamb. It's so, so much easier to get like a lamb roast dinner than to cook a full lamb, let it marinate for 24, 48 hours or whatever, and, and enjoy a proper meal. What I'm trying to say is waiting is tough, and this, the, the microwave generation that we're in does not help at all. And so Saul so waited seven days, but when in the waiting period, people started to leave. People started to leave him. People went away. People started panicking. And sometimes the waiting, while we're waiting on our miracle, can be very tough. While we're waiting for God to come through, it can be tough. It can feel tough um, to, to maybe pay these bills. It can be tough to try and make this marriage work when it's not working. It can be tough praying and waiting on this child that maybe is being a bit problematic, which I was at some point, but someone waited, so we're good. But waiting can be tough. And waiting tests our integrity. And maybe I just want to take a second to talk that maybe today or you're on your seventh day of your miracle. And I'm not saying tomorrow your, your miracle is coming through. I'm not saying that. But maybe you're on the seventh day. Maybe you're very close to the miracle that God is about to give for you. But don't compromise in your waiting for, for what God is about to do. Don't compromise. Let's not wait. Let's not give in. Let's not feel like, you know what, I've waited so long, so I'm just going to be unequally yoked. I've waited so long, so this marriage is done. Let's carry on waiting. I've waited so long for this child, but it's not coming. But let's just maybe stay and wait on God because maybe you're so close to the miracle that God is about to give for you, um, and, and we just don't know it. Because the saddest thing is I see that Saul did, he commits, he, he does the burnt offerings, and just as he did his burnt offerings, 
the Bible says just. Just as he had disobeyed God, just as he had compromised on his honesty and integrity, Samuel comes in. And he was so close to receiving the miracle of God. He was so close. The Bible says that at that point, God took Saul and his um, generations away. So God not just had a plan for Saul, but for his generations. And that moment compromised his generational blessings. And I wonder if we would just wait on God, if we would just wait for that miracle. And maybe we're so close today. And I want to encourage you to just stay waiting on God. Do not compromise. Do not give in. But just wait on God because maybe you are so close to your miracle. Amen. Amen. Um. And maybe the worship team can maybe help me as I, as I close this out. Um, the three points I said was integrity is built on principles. Second one is integrity is tested in adversity. And the final is integrity is tested in the waiting. You see, just as Saul or had committed these, burnt, as given the burnt offerings, um, Samuel had just come. And we read one of the saddest scriptures, I think, in the Bible. There's a few of them. But this is definitely one of the saddest scriptures as well. Verse 13, it says this. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commandment. Um, In a few chapters before this, God picked Saul. Saul was not picked by man. God picked Saul. Um, and God had a purpose and a calling for Saul. And not just Saul, but Saul's kids, his generations. But this moment where he compromised integrity, where he compromised honesty, um, kind of cost him his calling. And it cost him his generational um, call that God had over him. And I wonder what the lack of integrity and honesty is costing us in our life. Because maybe we don't see it. But maybe our kids are watching us. Maybe our kids are watching how we live our life. And maybe that's going to affect how they live life. And so I don't know how the lack of honesty and integrity is affecting us. Um, And maybe the generations to come. But what I do know is God ends up picking someone called David. He says God ended up picking someone, a man after his own heart. And if you read about David, David ended up being a king. But he's also an adulterer. He was a murderer. But he's still known as a man after God's own heart. Not just here, but even in Acts as well. So throughout history, he's known as a man after God's own heart. And I think the difference between David and Saul was that he demonstrated his faith. And he was committed to following the Lord. Yes, he messed up. We all do. But he was committed to following the Lord in every area of his life. He was integrated. Um, his His faith was tested on a grand scale. And he failed at times. But after his sin, he sought and received the Lord's forgiveness. And in the final analysis, David loved God's law and sought to follow it exactly. A man after God's own heart and a role model, I'm sure, for all of us. And as I've been prepping for this and as I've been reading this and, you know, integrity is not easy. Honesty is not easy. Does, that, does anyone think it is easy? Because if it is, you've got to write a book, man. It will be... Uh, It will be definitely a bestseller. It's not easy. And that's why we need Jesus. Because we can't do it alone. We can't do it without Jesus. And when Jesus comes into our lives, he helps us live a life that is worthy, that has honesty, that has integrity. And he will help us on that journey. And it could be tough. It could be daunting. But when he's there, he he literally transforms your life. He's transformed mine. And he could transform yours too. And you're probably listening to this and maybe you've never heard of Jesus before. Or maybe you're hearing this and thinking, you know what? I've come a long way. I've compromised integrity. I've compromised honesty. Um, It's true that Saul, at this moment, his kingdom was taken away, but he still reigned for about 40 years. He had 40 years to turn around. He had 40 years probably to turn back to to what he was. He was still king for a long time is what I'm trying to say after he was dethroned. And maybe he didn't take the opportunity to come back to God. And so I want to invite and give the opportunity for people today that are saying, you know what? I've probably gone quite far away. I've gone quite far away. Or maybe you've never heard Jesus before till today and you're thinking, you know what, I need Jesus. Um, And I just want to give people the opportunity to make that decision and to come back home. Um, And when you do, God is able to change your life and he will be with you every step of the way. He will help you live a life of honesty and integrity. 
So what I'm going to ask you to do is maybe everyone to just bow your heads down and close your eyes. David says, search my heart, O God. And so maybe we need to ask God, search my heart. Not just you, me too. Because I need it just as much as you do. And as I said, integrity is not perfection. But with a life with Jesus, he will help us through. Um, And if you're hearing this today and you're thinking, you know what, I need to come back home. Or maybe you're saying, I need to say yes to Jesus because I need him in my life. I need him to, to lead me. At the count of three, I want you to just put your hands up. Because sometimes we need to know, our body needs to know that we're making this commitment. You know, nothing magical is going to happen when you put your hands up. But it's a commitment to say, do you know what? I welcome Jesus into my heart. I'm going to come back home. And I'm going I'm to live this life. And so if that's you today, when I say free, why don't you put your hands up? One, two, three free. See your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, you can put your hands down. Amen. 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 What I want to do is I want, if you put your hands up, or maybe you're too shy to put your hands up, I want you to repeat this prayer after me. In fact, no one prays alone, so we're all going to repeat, and we're going to pray this prayer after me. Father God, I thank you that you love me so much. And there's nothing that I could ever do that will stop you from loving me. Today I invite you back into my heart. Would you lead me? And would you help me live a life of honesty and integrity? I want to live for you. In Jesus' name. Hi everyone, we're coming towards the end of September, there's lots of new things ahead of us, but there's two things that are going to be happening for the last time for now during this week. The first one is the prayer and fasting, so it's been great to see so many people at prayer and fasting, there's been more people every week, you've got one more chance, so set your alarm, make sure you get your Zoom link so you can join us for prayer 7 till 7.30 on Wednesday, and then... We've got so many ministry functions or ministry streams as we're now calling them at ECCI and a couple of them are coming to the end of their cycle in terms of who's been leading them. We've had a fantastic leader in the house and she's still around, Anne Evans, but because of care issues we need to raise a new team for Friendship Power and for Toddlers. So Toddlers is a brilliant outreach ministry to our community full of people who otherwise would never come to church. It's a great mission opportunity. We need some volunteers and from them we need a focused leader with some vision to push that forward. And the same right at the other end of the scale with our seniors. And so Friendship Power is requiring a new leader, some new volunteers, new energy, new ideas. So if you're in a season where you've got some time on your hands and that you feel that's important to the kingdom of God, get in touch with the office, whether that's toddlers or seniors, and serve the vision of the mission. So October's literally around the corner, days away, and uh, our ladies are having two fantastic breakfasts on the 2nd and on the 16th. The second one you need a Zoom link for, so details of that are coming up. Make sure you rock up either with your rabbit food or your full English, whatever. But the 16th is in person, so you need to get in touch with the office, sign up for that extra free half hour on the end of it and we'll come and have some munches and some fun together so all the ladies in the house say yeah okay just two more quick things to tell you and we's done today one is the fact that we've got a new website up and running all very exciting with dancing girls and sparkly lights and not really but it's good it's great so you need to check out Erica, www.ecci.org. I knew that. And it's great, so check that out. Finally, our new theme for October. Our theme between October and Christmas, we're going to talk about the spirit-filled church. If you think that's been done and played out, it's not. We need to teach it and live it. And on the 3rd of October, it's going to be Communion Sunday. And... uh, 
we want you to hang around after church. We like to give a full meeting towards considering the Lord's table. But afterwards, we're going to be having coffee together. So come prepared to share some stories, some life, and have some fun with your brothers and sisters. Don't run off after church. You remember when we were telling you you've got to go straight after church onto the street? No, you don't. Now you can stay and have a coffee with us. Have a lovely coffee with us. Share some coffee with us. Have coffee on that first Sunday in October. So that's it everyone for all of our announcements today. Thank you for putting up with my foolishness. And now this. If you don't know me by now, you've been living under a rock for the last 21 years. Surely there can't be anything you don't know about Pastor Anth. You know, I've got three girls. You know, I grew up in Yorkshire. You know, none of them are married. You know, um, you don't know that I spent my first 12 years as an adult working for British Steel Corporation. And the truth is that's where I learned most about leadership. I learned such a lot during those years. You probably don't know that between 1981 and 1985, because after marriage, Tracy just weren't feeling it. I managed a rock band. I did. I ran a, a Christian rock band. We traveled up and down the land, had some great fun, developed some men along the journey. One of our band members was Jim Bailey, the kids minister. So lots of people saved, laid hands on someone who had a diseased foot and saw them healed. That was the first time I got Jim Bailey to pray for anyone. Fantastic four years. Um, yeah, there's a bit of a rocker still left inside me. Maybe I'll bust a move if we get blessed today. That's it. Stuff about me you didn't know. Oh, that and um, apparently I'm slightly overweight. Bye.